Okay, so welcome. And again, thank you so much for um, joining us this evening. My name is Chris Linder and I am an associate professor in the Department of Ed Leadership and Policy. And I also um, serve as the Director of Graduate Studies for the department, um, as well as, sorry, Yes, this is recording. Um, as well as, so I'm, I am an associate professor in the department. I've been here, this is, I'm starting my third year at the U. Um, and prior to becoming faculty at the U, I was a faculty at the University of Georgia in their student affairs program. Um, at the U, I also serve as a special assistant to President Ruth Watkins for violence prevention and education. And so my um, research interests, as you can imagine, largely center around relationship and sexual violence on college campuses. So that's a little bit about who I am. Um, tonight's information session, the intention of this session is to provide a broad overview of the program. Um, and then we will leave time at the end for you to ask any questions that you might have. So the overview of the session where we did introductions already, I'm gonna talk about the PhD program, what's involved in a PhD, um, what are some of the components of what you would be engaging in as a student here? Um, then I'll talk a little bit about funding and spoiler alert, we don't know anything. <laughs> so you can probably imagine um, in a COVID year, we are really, it's really unclear where money is going to be coming from and what kinds of hit we're going to take this year. So we don't know a lot about that, um, but I'll talk about how you can get more information later. We'll talk about the application process and then we'll move into questions. So that's the overview of the section. So the PhD program consists of a few major milestones. Um, so the first major milestone that students engage in is their coursework. And our coursework for the ALP PhD program is broken down into 12 credits of core coursework. So educational leadership and policy consists of students who are pursuing any kind of educational leadership across the P20 spectrum. So we do have some students who specialize in K-12 leadership. We have other students who specialize in higher education. And then we have some students who say, I don't want to specialize in either one. I want to work across the whole continuum. And so um, our coursework is set up to support students in any of those sort of tracks at this point. Um, so the four core courses are leadership theory, organizational theory, leadership, diversity, and social justice and education, and then education policy. So those are sort of the core courses that students kind of start with, but there's a, as you can imagine, this is a very fluid process and it often just depends on when courses are offered and that sort of thing. So there's that 12 credits and then every student also does um, 15 credits of specialization. So they get, they work with their major professor and figure out this is what kind of education I think I'm interested in. This is the route that might make sense for me. And it sounds like it's this magical process where all the stars align and you have these courses laid out and you say, I'm going to pick these six courses and it's going to work out perfectly. That does not happen. Melanie can talk about that a little bit later. Usually it happens more so people's specialization often rely, um, is based on what's available. Um, it's, a, it's based on what departments will allow external students to take courses. So there are a number of factors at play, but you can definitely work with your um, a major professor and your committee to um, figure out a, a process that will work for you. Something that I think it's important to know about a PhD is that many people think, oh, it's about the courses. The courses in some ways are the least important part of a PhD program. A PhD program is very much about self-directed learning. So certainly we have a curriculum set up and we have these expectations of 12 credits of core coursework and then 12 additional credits of research courses so we have those set up as a guide but then the rest of it becomes almost like a choose your own adventure which is really it's really important for phd students to take initiative and figure out what works for them and to have some flexibility in the process if you knew what you were doing we wouldn't have jobs so it's okay to not know everything when you start a program. In fact, it's better to not know everything when you start a PhD program and to be flexible and open to the process and to see what emerges. So 
we've got that co content piece. We also have a whole nother section of coursework that focuses on research credits. So there are 12 um, core research courses, Introduction to Inquiry, and then everybody takes an, a quantitative method and a qualitative method. And then students choose nine more credits, so three more classes of advanced methods. I will say most students at this point say, I either, I'm gonna go a quant route or a qual route, and they choose their methods classes that way. Some students don't though, because they wanna do more mixed methods research. And so it just depends on the student, um, but, but um, you again are in charge of sort of building out your own curriculum based on what is important to you. Every student also engages in six credits of what's called a research apprenticeship. And this can happen in a number of different ways. So the, the purpose of a research apprenticeship is for you to get experience, hands-on experience doing research with a faculty member. And this can happen in a many ways. Some research or some faculty members have research teams and they invite people to be on their research teams and they're involved in various aspects of the process. So for example, Dr. Amy Bergerson, one of our faculty members, she just led or is in the process actually of leading a huge study on COVID and how faculty and staff and students are experiencing education in a pandemic world. Um, and students were involved in doing interviews. Um, right now they're in the process of doing data analysis. So she's had members of her research team getting academic credit for engaging in her research process. The other way that this could happen is if you had your own area of interest that you wanted to just try out and you didn't have the experience yet, you could approach a faculty member and say, I really want to do research on X. Would you support me? Um, and so it could be that a faculty member would be like, yeah, I kind of have that interest too. I'll support you. Let's figure this out. And so that could be another way that people would get their research um, apprentice credit. So coursework is one big milestone. It's usually the one that people do first, though simultaneously with doing your coursework, you're also starting to think about selecting a committee because as you get towards the end of your coursework, we have what's called a program of study meeting, which is where you meet with your committee and you decide and you present to them, these are the courses I've taken, this is how I think it fits together, this is how it supports my research. And they say, it looks good. Sometimes they have suggestions for courses you didn't even know about that can enhance what you're doing. So you do it before you're done with coursework so you can get additional feedback or information from your committee members. Um, you also, when it comes to advising, a common question students have is that, so you'll be advised what's referred to as a, or sorry, you'll be assigned what's referred to as a temporary advisor when you start in the program. And that's usually based on what you share your research interests are in your statement of purpose. Um, and then after you've been here for a while, you need to solidify who your committee chair, sometimes people refer to it as major professor, you need to determine who that's going to be. And students um, can choose this for a number of different reasons. Often it's chosen based on shared research interests. However, in a program as broad as ed leadership and policy, it is not uncommon to have students doing research on things that nobody on faculty does research about. And that is A-OK. -okay. It does not have to be directly in line with a faculty member in our um, program or department. Um, and so sometimes students choose a a chair based on jiving with somebody. They really appreciate the way the person gives feedback. They appreciate the way the person gives guidance. There's just a good synergy between the two people. And so sometimes that's how a chair gets chosen. Um, and then, then we so you select a committee. The committee consists of two faculty and ELP. Uh, yeah, three. So two count two in addition to your chair. So your chair is an ELP, and then you have two additional faculty and ELP plus two external people. They can be external to the U or just external to the department. Then students engage in what we call a qualifying exam, which is something that again happens at the very end of your coursework. Um, and it's just a demonstration of what you've learned throughout your coursework and how that has set you up to jump right into your dissertation. So I'm not gonna go into the details of a qualifying exam here because that's a long ways down the road, but it's just a part of the process that helps you sort of make the connection between your coursework and your research. And then of course, the culminating experience is writing a dissertation. Um, students will write the first three chapters of a dissertation, which is called the proposal. They share that with their committee. They do a presentation to their committee. 
their committee gives them feedback and says, I think this looks really good. I would add this, I would take this out. They give them feedback. The student then goes and collects and analyzes the data, writes up the final dissertation, which includes the first three chapters plus usually chapters four and five that are the findings and discussion of the findings. There are lots of various formats for dissertation. That's sort of the general, more traditional one, but there are lots and lots of ways to go about doing that. But that's the culminating experience for people in a PhD program. Um, another, yeah, Melanie. Um, Teddy was saying that they have a friend who's trying to get into the room, but- Oh, thank you for letting me know. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, hopefully everyone's in now. All right, um, yes, so that's where we are on the, PH, the, the components of a PhD program. Sometimes people will ask, what's the difference between a PhD and an EDD? And the answer to that question is it depends on who you ask and it depends on the institution. But generally speaking, the difference between a PhD and an EDD is that a PhD is very heavily focused on the research aspect of creating and generating new knowledge. So in a PhD program, you take a lot more research courses than in an EDD program. An EDD program is generally more focused on practice. And so people are thinking about how do I get in depth in this scholarship and then apply it to my practice. But they don't know, they do do a capstone project, which is similar to, but not the same as a dissertation project. So that's the biggest difference. Um, how do I apply? So the application process for applying to the PhD SEU um, in this department is that you go to the apply yourself system, um, which is a university wide system where everybody applies for admission. Um, and you're applying technically for admission to the graduate school and then each individual department or program also has um, application procedure. So when you go to the apply yourself system, it's gonna have like a gen general application that asks you all kinds of demographic information. You'll, that's where you're gonna pay your $55 admissions, or sorry, $55 um, application fee. It's gonna ask for your transcripts. You need to be very intentional about selecting the program that you want to apply to. So you'll see a number of programs in there. You'll wanna be intentional about paying attention to that. And then you'll submit two different writing pieces. One of those is your statement of intent or research. And in that you should include which faculty you think you might wanna work with. Um, and talk about why that is. Um, and then your argumentative essay is um, one of two prompts that are available on our website. One of them is about the significance of education in addressing inequity in the, U in the world. And the second one is about the role of education broadly. Um, so you can choose which one of those you wanna follow when you write an essay about that. And then you'll submit three letters of recommendation. Notice, there are no GRE scores in this list. The University of Utah's ELP program has discontinued the use of GRE scores. And I want to say we did this before COVID hit. We voted last fall to discontinue the use of GRE scores. So this is not a response to global pandemic. This is um, something that we are doing from this point forward. And our primary decision, or our primary motivation for this decision is that it's an issue of access and equity. So being mindful of the ways that those um, tests have left a lot of people out um, historically. And then also knowing that they're not actually all that predictive of a person's success. Um, they're actually more closely tied with people's um, family income than they are with um, predicting success in a graduate program. That's what most research says. So a few tips for applying to the question. program. Yeah. Uh, oh, or do you want me to wait for questions? So yeah, let's wait for questions so I can stop recording. Okay, no problem. Yep, cool. So a couple of tips um, on applying. Be authentic. Um, what I mean by this is to um, just show up as your full self. It's really obvious when someone writes an essay and then goes to a thesaurus to try and sound smart. It doesn't work. Don't do that. Just write. Write from your heart. 
right? Really what you're thinking about. That doesn't mean don't get it edited. Certainly, please ask your support systems to read it, give you feedback if it makes sense, if there are parts that could be more clear. All of that is really important. It is important that it's, a, that it's clear, clearly written and, and well written. Um, but that doesn't mean just substituting big words for little words. <laughs> so be authentic is my number one piece of advice that I always tell students. And another tip about applying is that at least one of your letters of recommendation should be from an academic source. And what that means is that it should come from somebody who knows how you show up in a classroom and what your strengths are as a student and can really speak to um, your ability to be successful in a graduate program. Um, funding. So graduate assistantships, like I said, we don't know. So students in our program typically either go full time or part time. So um, when when we say so, um, when we say they're going to school full time, usually that means that they have a graduate assistantship or some other part time job, and they're taking at least nine, if not more, credit hours every semester. Other students work full time and do their degree part time. Now that doesn't mean they never take nine credit semesters. They often take nine credit semesters. It just means they're balancing a full time job with going to graduate school at the same time. So for students who want to pursue graduate assistantships, um, we often have graduate assistantships. They're frequently research assistantships directly tied to a faculty member's area of research and they're often um, from grants that those faculty members have. Like I said, we don't know very much about these at this point. Um, so we will let you know as soon as we do. It will probably be January before we know what positions we have available. But what we do at that point is, so the application deadline is December 1st to apply for the program. And what we'll do is for everybody who's applied to the program, when we know what the assistantship opportunities are, we'll send everybody a note saying here are the assistantship processes and that application process is actually separate from admission so you get admitted as a student first and then you get you find out about graduate assistantship funding opportunities and that process can take place throughout the whole spring semester um, and then that the last slide here has our contact information on it so it has me um, and then it has Marilyn who's our academic coordinator um, she knows everything it's a fancy title for queen of the office um, she really does know everything about our curriculum she's worked here for a very long time and so she's an excellent resource so um, i'm going to stop the um recording and stop the presentation um